So we have the first person to present uh, is um, Ademi G. Ademi Yi, Aribido. You see that this, if you are around, please link up with us. You have to present, present now, then the after, Okola Mauro presents after him. Ademi Yi. Mr. Adeni, I think. Mr. Adeni, can you please unmute yourself and speak to us now? Yes, good evening, all. I'm with you. Can you hear me very well? Yeah, okay. Good evening, and uh, welcome to the section. I'm the first presenter, and um, do I have the floor? Yeah, please, please last us 15 minutes to make the presentation. 12 minutes. For your presentation, and then after uh, your question. You can go ahead. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, my paper, just as um, the uh, said is um, I'm presenting on the, um, exploring the identity of the North people through archaeological material material remains. Um, let me share my um, my screen with you so that you can see I have um, a copy of my paper on the, um, this topic we are looking at. And um, the paper as the topic is we're looking at the knock people through archaeological lens. You know, these are prehistoric people can that- um, can you say the, uh, see your slides? Hello, can you hear me better now? Yes, I mean your slides, your slides. Is my what? Slides. Slides. Your PowerPoint slides. Yes, that is what I want to share. That is what I want to share with you now. Yeah, sorry, a minute. Um, so um, we are looking at the identity of the North people through the lens of um, archaeological materials left behind. And um, sorry, one minute. Is your time is counting? Yes, I know, I know, I know, I'm with you. Yeah, so that we are looking at them through the archaeological lens, please, it's like I have a problem with the device, but I will share with you. Um, in my introduction, I we are looking at the Nok people as um, the people whereby this, uh, the first Nok terracotta was discovered in the process of tin mining in this area and um, is uh, well known for its terracotta sculpture. That is one of the famous things that characterize the Nok people because of the terracotta in that area. And um, apart from the terracotta, the age and the date of the knock is one of the earliest dates for iron smelting in um, the sub-Sahara. And uh, the first knock terracotta was discovered in the process of tin mining in this community. And um, that was reported to Bernard Fag, the first archeologist that worked in that area. After which, um, um, systematic excavation was carried out in that area. Uh, my second slide is uh, where you have the knock, the, the where you have the um, the map of the knock culture area, showing the geographical coverage of the knock. It's cut across some states in Nigeria as we speak now. Um, um, but in the north central part of Nigeria, that is where the knock terracotta of the knock um, culture spread across. And, um, and, um, and uh, the three archaeological sources that we're using to look at the lens of these people is one, the terracotta and um, the pottery and also the Iron Age, the date for iron, which this culture has uh, produced or given to us. If we are familiar with the knock or culture area, 
we discovered that the date of 1500 BC to um, 500 BC is the date given for this culture area, which made it one of the oldest in the sub-Saharan Africa. Sorry, please, is a, the challenge I have with the, the device, um, I'm still trying to get this slide to us so that we can all be on the same page with my presentation. So um, the dates for the for the um, for the for the culture for the no culture is uh, what has uh, necessitated the the making it one of the famous for iron smelting and uh, the terracotta fragment in that area. As well, we are looking at the um, knock through the pottery by the decoration and the the decoration that the pottery has and the the, pot, the decoration and the form made it one of the unique attributes of the that made them special as a people and as well the iron smelting. Uh, please just a moment because I have to get this so that we can all see the images of the knock um, that we're looking at, then the geographical area where the culture covers and other, or, or other um, aspects of this paper presentation. Because without the image or without us having a look at what we're looking at, I think it makes the paper or it won't give us a clearer view of what we're discussing about this evening in this paper section because uh, we need to have the um to look at the 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 or well, look at the the pic the, the the slide sorry so that we can see the slide of what we're discussing and um we can have a look at what we are looking at as a paper this evening I think sorry, I think I left it in my some in my drive in the office. Sorry, please. I'm very sorry. Let me just quickly um, yes, okay. So that uh, we are looking at it and the distance. And uh, I need to uh, what is so special about this knock terracotta what because we're looking at them from the lens of archaeological remains in that area. You know, the knock terracotta by the virtue of the, the decoration of the design of the eye, the face, and the nose, and the beautiful necklace and um, anklet and bracelet they have, that is one of the unique attributes of these terracottas or the knock, uh, the knock objects by the virtue of the terracotta and um, the 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 decoration and the edru, that is what makes the knock terracotta unique in its sense. And um, when we're talking about these knock people, you know, there are people that, um, because we've been working in this area and presently I'm also, my PhD research is on, I'm working on iron smelting in that same culture, in the knock culture area. Uh, we are looking at these people that we can't really find a direct descendant of the people because by the virtue of the spread of the North culture, it's cut across so many states. So we can trace the origin. So what we can use to identify or exploit these people, exploit the identity of these people is just the material remain, which archeological sources is the primary evidence we're using in this area. And um, we are also looking at these people um, from the, perspective of the other aspect of the knock, which we've explored in the course of our work, not just these three um, main points that my paper or the archaeological, the three basic archaeological sources that my paper is looking at. There are other aspects of the knock culture that we've looked at, like their burial tradition, their, the, the burial tradition of the people, and also the this knock object what is so special about the terracotta? What makes this terracotta unique in its sense? 
because we are discussing, uh, we are looking at this, this terracotta that what makes this knock terracotta special or unique is um, we, in, the, in our attempt to do this, we look at the uses of the knock terracotta. And we found out that um, in this knock culture area, there are faces that this terracotta object or the, or the stages of the use of this terracotta object. At a particular stage in this culture area, we discovered that um, the people that lived or that made this terracotta had a direct or they had an important in the use or they see this terracotta as something unique that they cherish. And um, the latter phase or in the earlier phase of our work in the North culture area, we discovered that these same people that adore or that use this terracotta made deliberate attempt to destroy in one of our excavation in one of our sites known as Pangwari, where we excavated um, the, the, the knock terracotta. We discovered that this terracotta was deliberately destroyed and buried by the people that made them. So what begin or part of what we begin to um, discuss or the inferences we begin to make about this when we discover this about the North culture that the people actually destroy this terracotta at a phase or during the period whereby religion that is the coming of either Christianity or Islam to the culture to this to this culture area and they no longer see this beautiful work of art which they've made and they now start they started destroying it. Also a very rich aspect of this no culture that we're exploring and uh, that is the focus of my PhD work is uh, the iron because I the iron in the no culture area. We've excavated a lot of iron smelting sites or furnaces within this no culture area and um, we have different faces or different era of the no culture iron smelting. It, sir? Okay, just okay to conclude. Um, in the conclusion, just as I've said in the course of my paper, that um, what we are using to explore the identity of these people is just the archaeological uh, material remain, and we're not just looking at this archaeological material remain on the surface, we've carried out systematic excavation and dating. That is why you can see in one of my slides where I gave a date of that we are using for this no culture 1500 BC to 500 BC. It is because of this the dating, because all uh, most of our work in this area, we've carried out laboratory studies and we dated them. And that is why we can give a vivid account of these people. Thank you very much. And I... Thank you very much for your presentation. Any question for Mr. Uh, Rindes? Well, question, Mr. Rindes? Yes, I'm with you, sir. Okay, you have a question here. Please hold on. So, um, is there any particular significance to the hairdo? Because you, you said the hairdo is what makes the North Terracotta special. I'm, I'm correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that's what was said. Is there any special, anything special about that particular hairdo? Because I know there's different hairdos that are indigenous to the region where it comes from. So, is there any significant meaning that hairdo holds? Well, to the knock terracotta, the significance of the hairdo. Yes, you know, if you look at um, the yes, it is the significance is um, what somebody else is looking at in his um. um for his um, master's thesis, that is looking at assessing the um, the terracotta, that is the air do the bracelet, the bracelet, and all other decoration. You know what its significance about the air do from what we've looked about that this air or the air do were actually infused. What this that is what is that we discovered that because the way they were detailed, the meeting the air do is detailed that what signal we discover that they were made independently because they are so detailed and uniquely made and then infused into the masterpiece or into the decor, into the um, terracotta. That is one of the reasons, but there's somebody doing a detailed um, 
an um study of the of this. Okay. Right. Thank you very much. Do I, do I answer your question, sir? I feel like the person that has done the change. Okay, it's okay, it's okay. Ah, let's have the next person, David Okolawo. Mr. David Okolawo, are you set? Yes, I'm with you now. Thank you very much. Let's have your paper. One minute, I'm trying to share my. Okay, can you see my screen? Okay. Yes. Guys. Okay. So uh, thank you very much. So everybody has been talking about identity in Nigeria and all of that. So I'm going to do something different. I'm going to take you a little bit not um west of the way of West Africa. So I'm going to talk, I'm going to be talking about food ways on the Atlantic Bonds Island in Syria alone, the agency of free African women. Right, so there are lots of conversation about the Atlantic trade and all of that, but this particular one focuses on the agency of free African women. I know how we are all, I know how we all are about slave trade and all of that, but for the purpose of this work, my focus is on the free local women and not, of course, the enslaved people and all of that. Thank you. So the Atlantic trade that started about 500 years ago facilitated a whole lot of change in terms of social change of which identity is a part of cultural change, economic changes, and all of that. But in terms of the kind of research that has been done, we see a whole lot of focus large on large scale economic outcome of the of the Atlantic trade. Or oh, um you know, how much was made from the Atlantic trade? Um how many people were enslaved? How do we conserve the relics of the Atlantic trade? We forget that this world system was sustained by a quotidian interaction between people. Right, we had this cultural interaction between the Europeans and the Africans. Sometimes the European, the Europeans, the Americans, and the Africans. Right. So, why there are daily European accounts in terms of oh, we went to West Africa. This is what we saw. This is what West Africans are like. There are no accounts as to what were the roles of the Africans in terms of sustaining this social system. Right. And in terms of when I stay. Africans, I'm talking specifically or particularly about African women. So my research uses Bons Island as a case study to explore this. Bons Island is an island in Syria alone, a very unique island, unique for a number of reasons. It's one of the best examples of the cultural intersections that happen in the Atlantic trade, in the sense that on Bons Island, we had people from Europe migrating or moving or exporting enslaved people to North America. And then we, so we have this North America, Europe, and African connection. It's also important because this was one of the ports that were known for, um, that were known to be very profitable. It's also very important because it has this very consistency, consistency in the occupation. We are looking at English and then the English and the Scots, as opposed to what you see in other places where you see English and then um, 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 Dutch, Portuguese, and all of that. So on Bones Island, what we have are European men who had African women living with them, or who had African women serving their domestic duties. Previous research on Bones Island, of course, started in about 1993. There was a archaeological reconnaissance. In 2006, there was shovel testing. In 2017 and 18, they had this restoration and stabilization work. And all of these materials, have yielded a whole lot of archaeological materials in terms of fauna, in terms of other European materials, and in terms of some of the some local materials. And what we have on the right here is like a rough sketch of what Bonds Island looks like. But like I mentioned earlier, let's focus on the number of all the, the, the two categories of people who live in Bonds Island, the local African women and the Europeans. Don't forget, the Europeans at that point in Upper again in the upper again coast, we're having a mortality ratio of over 50 percent. So they don't move into the interland. They stay on the port. They do all of their transactions on the port. They didn't move into the interland until the colonial period of the 20th century. 
or maybe the late 19th century. So my work focuses on, of all the materials that have been, that have been um, recovered, my work focuses on what I'm discussing here today focuses on the fauna, if I say fauna, I mean animal remains and uh, ceramics to look at how did these cultures intersect, right? How did these two people intersect with each other? And what kind of identity came out of this intersection? Let's look at these two accounts. In one of the accounts of um, Far Cambridge, Anna, to say that, look, it says, all the European males had African women who served their domestic duties. Domestic duties are very red and wide. It could be kitchen duties, it could be um, uh, other room duties, it could be so domestic duties, it could be laundry duties, and all of that. Another account says, I was expecting that at least something good would appear. This person was talking about food. But I was astonished when I saw the feast was no more than a plate, not the plate, of couscous and a plate of boiled beef, boiled in goat. Whose foul smell upset me when I sniffed it? My mistress, an African now, used both hands to seize one of the pieces of boiled beef and tore it into scraps by sticking with it. She then took some couscous and a little meat and screwed it up in the palm over the dish. This made me feel sick. Let's pay attention to this place. I had completely lost my appetite. However, I had to make some show of responding, for I had gone with the set purpose of resuming the company's trade deal. And these blacks do not take kindly to anyone criticizing their manners or even less their fists. So what we see here is a sort of power play. We had Europeans coming to Boys Island for trade, right? But in order for their trade to be successful, they couldn't go into the interland. They needed to negotiate with the locals, right? These locals, in this, according to this account, and according to what we have on bonds, were African local women. And even though the Europeans came with their own doxa, with their own idea of this is what a food should look like, a food should not, beef should not be boiled, it should be roasted. Food should come in a plate, right? They still had to make do with what the African women were giving them. So let's look at what the archaeological record says. Does it does it support this? Does it go against this? So, like I mentioned, we are looking at ceramics and fauna. For ceramics, we are looking at do we have local ceramics or were they European ceramics? If we have local ceramics, we know that okay, they're African women, yeah, African women in print. European ceramics, European traders in print. Oh, what forms were they? For the, for the forms, note the use of plates. What we had in Europe at that time from the 17th, 18th century was the use of plates because what they were doing was roasting. What we had in the upper Guinea coast was the use of bowls because a lot of our foods are soup based. What we have in Europe at that time was individualistic eating. What we have in Africa at that time was communal eating. So we're looking at are we having this individualistic eating? Are we going to have this communal style of eating? Now, in terms of the animals, we're looking at, are we going to get West African animals? Were they importing their food? Or were they cooking or boiling the African way as narrated in that account? Or were they roasting their food? Roasting in this context is what was very popular in, in, in Europe. So we also look at how, what was the preparation model like? Were they mashing? Were they using machines to cut their, their, their beef, which was very popular in Europe at that time? Or were they using hand and matches to cut it? So this is what we found. In terms of the fauna analysis, we saw a lot of cattle, we saw chicken, which are animals very popular around West Africa, right? Some of these animals can also be found in Britain or in, in Europe. But the question is, why would we bring animals that we can source locally within West Africa from Europe? And also pointing to the fact is the fact that we have all the body parts represented. If they were importing these animals from Europe, what we'll be expecting is we'll have some choice parts Let's also look at the other things that we have, right? We um, also have the tortoise indigenous to West Africa. We have these two wild animals. This is um, this is this up here is the tragus and the one down is redonka. These are two types of antelopes that are peculiar to West Africa, especially the upper Guinea coast region. These are the kind of cut. This is the kind of cut marks that we have, which is not um, speaking to to saw cutting, it speaks to the manual style of using for plastic. So all of these sort of points to, oh, we have West African uh, animals, we have West African style of uh, uh, cutting. Now, 
the what we have up here is for the pot boiling their food or whether you roasting it. So we looked at people who have done analysis in the past, look at at what point if you roast your 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 beef, what color does the bone come out in? If you if you cook it, if you pot boil it, what color does it come out in? We also looked at cut sizes. If they were roasting, we'll have the sizes big. If they were pot boiling, we'll have the sizes small. So what we have is a situation where most of those beef were pot boiled. In terms of the ceramics, like I mentioned, plates, rope, bowl, Africa. See what we have here. We have a lot of bowl and no plates, right? And then we have drinking vessels and jam storage. So important thing, all the ceramics that we had are imported with no local ceramics. So what we see is, yeah, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll, no, don't worry. We'll, we'll let you choose the kind of bowls you or the kind of um, forms of ceramics you want, they are going to import it, right? It's also a shift from, oh, Africans use this local thing, or oh, we'll embrace this thing, it gives us an idea of class. So, of course, we serve the domestic gifts to the euro, but we still want to maintain the forms, we still want to maintain the kind of food that we eat, right? And this is what we see with the, with the uh, ceramics analysis there. So in terms of inter interpretations, I look at food ways as a chain of events that starts from what do you conceptualize as food, right? And then ends with discard. How do you discard food materials? Conceptualization. We know that wild and domestic animals from West Africa that we saw points to women's influence as food custodians, right? In terms of procurement, while the ceramics were largely European, the shape and function were heavily influenced by African women. They decide what to do, so they have to give you the form of ceramics to import. In terms of preparation, this was also very largely African. In terms of distribution, what we see was very individualistic, but not completely individualistic, which you will see in some of the written records, like the one I showed you earlier. The, the um, wife was attending to her husband. So even though it's not very common, now, we still see a little bit of individualism. And in terms of postcard, we also see this very interesting thing of African women now making buttons from discarded scapulars that we're selling to also make economic gains. In conclusion, while African chiefs, that I don't speak to here, Muslim men, paid, played roles as landlords who focus on economic dealings, how do we tax the Europeans, how do we manage the Atlantic trade, and all of that. African women, free African women, mostly daughters of the fam or families of the chiefs, that the chiefs are given to the Europeans as wives in order to monitor the number of people that were exporting or the number of trade within the highland. These women played social roles that sustained or pillared the Atlantic system, but these people are largely overlooked in the written records. So if you want to look at the Atlantic system as a whole, it is important to look at these people and the role they played in the kind of cultural entanglement and transformation that eventually now moved from the um, West African coast into the interland. Thank you very much. Very much um, appreciation to all of my sponsors, <laughs> Rutgers University, Rutgers <laughs> so we are alone, Lewis and Clark, and others. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. David Ogalamo. Hello, are you still there? Yes. Okay, thank you for the presentation. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, I have a question for you. Hello? Okay. I have a question for you. Okay. I can, I yeah. can hear you. Okay. Um. Based on what you have said so far now, do we still have people living on the coast? I mean, the women living on the coast. If they are still living on the coast, can we, can we carry out a kind of ethnographic study in order to detect the continuity of that culture in terms of identity? Because so, yeah, thank you very much. Um, so, of course, the you no know, culture is. Uh, even though it, we we won't want to say it changes, we see this continuing culture. But what we, I'm getting somewhere, Mr. Suleiman. You asked the question. Let me answer your question. So people no longer live on Bonds Island, but the influence of this entanglement has moved from Bonds Island to the interland and across. You will see it everywhere today. We now a lot of us now use imported ceramics that we still. Yeah, so the, the influence has moved. And my research is historical, it speaks to entanglement on Bonds Island. So those people that have moved from that particular coastal area to the interland, did they carry that culture to the interland? Is there any evidence that they carry their culture on the coast to the interland? I mean, the cultural contemporary. 
Yeah, you see, you see that everywhere. That happens all across the coastal region. But my focus for this work is not what happens in the local community that I am post Atlantic period. It's Atlantic. That's why I have it in my research and in the topic that Atlantic period bonds island. So it's sort of time framed and it doesn't exceed that time frame. Thank you. Thank you. Any other question for me? Okay, please hold on. Yes, I know. Hold on, that question. Sorry, don't worry, let me handle it. We really thank you, our presenter, for what you have done to us the topic. My, my question is, is like, you really focus on women as the identity of the coastal region. I, don't, I want to know, is the male, uh, the, the ships or the male, are they not part of the trade in that region? Because you are telling us that it's the only the woman that made the foreigner and talk with them. I want to know more about it. What is the, what is the work of the men? Are they idle? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, let me, let me quickly respond to that. Thank you very much for your question. Like, I, if you check the conclusion, and I mentioned it in the conclusion, the men were chiefs. They handled the economic part and all of that. But the men did not live with the Europeans on, the, on Bonds Island. The men were living on the other side. They were living on the, where they had territory as chiefs. And, but on the island where they had all of these castles and forts, where they were using for the export of um, slave trade, what we had were European male and African female. Even, we, even if there were records of men, the record we have of men were men who would come, do their amazing work, maybe well drained, um, boat managers, and then return in the evening. They were not living with the Europeans as families. Okay. Okay. Any last question? Okay. Another one. Hold on. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. My name is Basila. I'm from National Institute for Nigerian Languages. Okay. Um. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you clearly, ma'am. Okay. Thank you very much. Why the one that the one of the picture? Yes. Please, I don't want you to. Make sure network network for you in that particular Thank you. Your network. Sorry, I didn't get your the your network was not very clear. Right. So, like, I want you to spend more on the network of methods that we use in gathering information from the data. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. So. The, the the methodology is like I mentioned some of the methodology in the work. The methodology is likely archaeological, right? The materials were already excavated. Basically, what we're looking at is do we have European materials or local materials? That's the first stage in terms of the ceramics. Then in terms of the ceramics, we move further. That what forms do we have? Do we have plates or we have um or we have bowls, right? If you can tell by your rim sides, the rim sides are wide in terms of the uh, both the rim sizes are conscripted. So you can tell in terms of sizes. And in terms of the animal remains, what you can use is comparative sample. You get it, you get an animal remain and then you look at it comparatively with um, some comparative with comparatively with others that you have that you have just acquired, right? So you have cow, you have um goat and all of that. So when you as when you get a, a final material, when you get an animal, you know what to just do is look at it in comparison in comparison to your samples, and then you can tell what kind of animal you're looking at. Thank you. Now, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lamo. Okay. okay. Another online uh, okay. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, um uh, the presenter. Just um, talking, looking at the sources closely, I just want to confirm because um, I was working with my uh, mentor sometimes ago. You know, when you were talking about fauna, you know, one very important source, actually is not my area of specialization that I later discover in his work, maybe working with him as an assistant sometimes ago. I want to ask, in this area, do you have um, rock paintings and engravings showing some of all these um, faunas? In that area where you're working, or there is no any rock painting, or as one of the sources you employ, or just strictly archaeological sources where what you use. Thank you. So, 
my my time frame is the transatlantic period. We are looking at something between five hundred years ago, between the sixteenth century till the. So it's not it's not the period where you would expect to see rock painting, right? It's a period where you it's more of like a global period. Period when things were already happening, the world was already very interconnected, and it's not a period of rock painting. So I didn't expect to see rock painting. I didn't see rock painting, and I didn't use rock painting. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Let's have the next paper. Okay. I will. I will want to present now. Yes. Yes. My time is just coming. Okay. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> my paper is entitled Technology as Identity, Iron Metallurgy in Italy, 200, 1200 to 1980. Okay. Um, well, um, I think why you are the topic, so that we, uh, you realize the fact that whether you like it or not, the historians and archaeologists. They are brothers and sisters. Yes. So, part, we use all right, I do not So, we work hand in hand, right? like it or not. So, we are together. So, archaeologists, historians, we work together. As an archaeologist, mainly we get our data from the first edition, that is systematic thinking of the hand. It's a view to retrieving material culture and interpreting the material culture for reconstructing the pathway of life. However, when an historian gives an account of a story of events, what an archaeologist protects the validity of that statement through excavation. When we excavate the dates, story materials, we now get a substitution between what we have in the context and oral tradition. Sometimes if they were apart, at times they fail. That's why we have some form of I mean, information, a kind of society, in terms of our observation. But however, both disciplines. Archaeology, history, they are things that we want to work hand in hand. And as a matter of fact, too, archaeology is more than This work is basically scientific. However, it speaks into this special uh, because of the method we use and kind of based on the blood from our investigation. It's basically archaeological, to archaeological, but understanding to get from part of it and see why we can use this identity and why it's very relevant in this session. Yeah, technology, identity. Okay, the sum of the ways in which those groups provide themselves with the material object of their civilization. I don't define it this way because I want to suit into technology and how relevant in technology context. We have identity, as according to the calling period dictionary, it's defined as instead of having unique characteristics held by no other person or thing. That is, identity is uniqueness. Now, actually, have two approaches to identity. We would then approach according to this sense. I'm talking about essential, permanent, fit quality, fit any life. That's according to June 1960. The other approach is the international statistics identity as mutable and socially contingent, constantly evolving, circumstantially over a period of time. You can see the key word there. And the last word, which of course is very relevant, is the class capital. Now, what happens with that capital? You are talking about now, archaeology, mm -hmm. identity. The past half year, 12 zero zero to 19 zero zero. Past half year, what happened then? In this way, there was a period of complex political system and class generation. Properly, the meta spelling, we have annual working, we have stone carving, we have uh, bead making, lots of class generation that existed in this period of 1200 to 1900. I'm saying my point now. So, however, of all these class positions, I am probably. Is a need in the middle. People have done a lot of work on iron working, they uh, stone carving, they've done a lot of work on green working, they've done a lot of work on other craft that are still in the middle. I thought iron smelting has been least investigated. That's what prompted us to do to do carry out this research and see the relationship between our result and the city that particular form that we saw come in this we get there. Now, iron methodology, the simple term. If you are to the ancient uh, sites, we are swelling, that is, I mean, starting of iron ore, it's been higher. You will see on the surface, slightly flat, 
The material remains that were produced from extraction of all. All is that material in which they extract metal in the past. You get the form from the institution of the United States, eat it, and extract all, tell them all for this. All is natural. What you find in the garden is not the Those that they have to run, they have put that. But that material for half days, you can decide, you can demonize, you can see that. But they don't talk about that all. People who have put this, melted it, and then they derive it. I don't However, in front of me, there are lots of materials, particularly slag, or we are crazy. You say that we saw the scatter. They are very useless. But they act as a kind of a coach in the position of those things that occur during the process of iron. I think that's good now. The slag that we see that are very useless. It's a coach. They have coach in there, in this again, that we can investigate the coach, we get the process that I saw in my hand. That is why. The kind of the lady is a visual. It's highly scientific, but at the same time, we will learn a lot of visual from it. Like I said, see, it's slab. They want more to see it matter that is all from a reduced iron ore, which is composed of gun material from the iron ore, foil ash, and flash material. That is slab. But they are just the useless. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, you can see this the map of the age showing uh, iron melting site in the past. So this is the other uh, 12 0 1900. And this is what we have uh, in there. You can see on here, this book type, they have an iron exhausted. This is post stone cabin. You know, I said during that period, they were post stone cabin, they were built making. So the encrusted stone iron on this material is symbolic. I have a symbolic, symbolic, and not doing it. Our intent is technology identity. Please move on to the next slide. Okay, now. For the history, chronology of electric. Those periods, between the period and this period of steel, they are the classical period, classical period, and post classical period. When we say pavement period, we know post case. Are we talking post case? Post case, post case. Are we being used to lay the kind of preparation? So then we see our uh, technology. But in fact, they use post case pavements. So when you say post case pavements, it existed during the period of classical and post classical period in electric. Next slide. Now, for this research work, three sites were investigated. OAU, Grand Sox, uh, Ifele. And this one is also JKB. So like three sites investigation for the research work. We carry out, let me go next slide. Next slide, I don't want us to read. Now, we carry out investigation in all these three sites within the industry. And the material was exhibited. We had slack. This one is from, you can see it's ITR. It's a grand source. All they do, probably farm, farm, farm sites. And this one is a for take it next site. Okay, now look at this after the old exercise. You see this on this, it's an archaeologist or an historian. If you look at this, after you see your uh have your excavation done, this is what will happen. Next. You have the scientific for you to study. Any material you find at the upper corner, it's assumed that that material is strongest following the law of composition. Mm -hmm. We have to have a now. So, some of the material we need to start to hold that. That's the end of the thing that we want to know the material position and the chronology. Now, you can see me, I mean, I'm seeing kind of the work there. Next one. Now, this is the slack that has the, how would I put it, the, the, the position of the, I mean, those actions, those points that happen during fire. You will you see them here, this kind of You will see them until you carry out science as a examination on there. Because it's like a code in there. But they are very useless. Come back all around. But when you take these samples, you put in them, put the different kinds of flow, it gives you lots of evidence. And the condition under which the firing took place. But you can also then by that to start inspection until you find out the laboratory, ask them, and then under the microscope, it's a light microscope. They give you a lot of evidence. Okay, the method we use, you can see optical microscopy, we have seen. Next one, next slide. Now. We don't need this. I don't want to show you the pieces of science. Next one, next slide. Okay, yes, this is the point. Now, from the analysis, there are lots of outside present which are like that. So, that useless material that appears on top of it. Get to the iron oxide. CIO2 is the iron oxide. FEO is iron oxide. So, we have magnesium oxide, sodium oxide, phosphorus oxide, lots of oxides. I'm going to analyze this. 
you will see the details. All of them are there. However, we are so much very, very particular about this dynamo site because in Yaston and Tim, to the rest and the day, the investigation in military, and it's told that this TIO, TIO in their sample has the highest value of all the outside states. Why? Why is that all the outside in the plan after the planning? So that the demo side is high. I have this not something that is so much. Even after the jury, generally, you have very low sensitivity for that particular outside, demo side. But for Ife, for Ife, very really good. Why? Why is it this? Is it because they are going to control the position? Or is it because the kind of attitude they, they use to cope with the environment? Then? Not to think very really much about the answer. Likewise. Now, in order to establish, establish the fact that if you should need the terms of technology of aerospace, we want to establish that. I have to compare the results of the result of Otaku 1992. Yes, you can see the states here. Unfortunately, I was able to put the, I to put the, the reference there. This is the work of Professor Kako in Dusu that eight five was investigated. Eight five we were investigated by Professor Kako, and we are like that. Look at it. It's done outside here. You can just see back here. In percentages from the laboratory. Can you see? Can you just come and see the back? Very low. 0.6%, 0.6%. Or from eight five in Dusu that different idea. However, this is what we have in effect of all the time in the laboratory. Look at this. Check the statistics out today. This is my interest. I want to see this. That is the 9.8, 9.3, That is the values. So the values of the IO2, the value of the size, as compared to other sites in Nigeria, as far as the system in Nigeria, is very, very clear that they have the very unique, they have the very unique technology which they were using. Otherwise, you, do, you shouldn't expect to have a very value. That's the uniqueness. Have you listened? Good. That is the uniqueness of that of that technology. The second one is the two. One. The kind of power they use and the kind of blending they did, missing the power over time. They mix their power, immunize, and start to get the, 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 the high limits from the power. And that is very easy on, on a clear connection. And that is why I have to do the kind of comparison so you can see that higher person technology is very unique when it comes to the terms of time of that composition compared to other regions of the world. This result is not, I mean, peculiar to this alone. You can compare, you can check online and check what are the other, I mean, slides from other regions, even after Nigeria. Why is it that interest and outside the position is so unique in there? This is the experience of technology. Was it because the environment changed with the across the field? So that's what you want to have. And by the fact, this result informed my decision about the kind of uh, my PhD. I'm very ready for PhD. I have to check this, I want to prove this further and check. Was it because of my environmental influence? Is it possible why they want to have money wanted to win? And they have that kind of strategy to cope with the very bad of the barrel. That's what we need to answer. Because why is it so unique to them in terms of slack of position? Am I going to start off? And in doing this thing, we should be ready not only applying scientific methods, but also some of the political. So much more, we also improve some of the political. We go to the different that are still. We are pregnant to find a person, or people those who are, I mean, kind of uh, relationship who are really the power to make some entire about and production in the locality and make the kind of um, effect that we're able to really see if possibly the tradition has been transferred from one to another, or it was simply peculiar to differ a role, or it extends to interest or to the green, but that could mean the river, uh, uh, the river kingdom in general. So that is just my uh, result. Now, in conclusion, you can see one, possibly two types of ores. You can mention all that naturally occurring substance. If we, we have the extract from the extract, metal, iron. Now, possibly, possibly iron too was used during the classical period. As well as 2300 parts of black sand. This is black metal. Then, that was the 17th century upward. They also have the source of the raw material changed two times. The matter changed where they source the material. However, you should know that the environment provided the opportunity for them to explore. If there are no power there, they wouldn't have been able to bring tire to bring that to the first class. As a matter of fact, environmental amenities is a concept of us to answer the key. If there are no more, they wouldn't have tired up to the first class. It's because there were more other things in the area, especially for us, and it makes one of the aspects. Now, we also have this the change in our procurement and innovation in policy to talk in the last sentence. 
Then finally, which is the standard of that? The third could be a potential indicator or a unique and a sub as regards methodology through the classical and classical period. Is it not clear? Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any question? Okay. Yes. Wow. Where did you start there? Yes. You mentioned that there is a relationship between archaeology and history. What of visual arts? Yes. Um, to my understanding, I think um let me just put it this way. Um I'm going to use a lot of raw ash. Uh, we use this raw ash. When you see whenever you see raw ash, it gives an impression of after perception of the environment in the past. Mm. It's a, a kind of what people did in the past. You can never see any form of rock art without having the meaning attached to it. People perceive any kind of perception of the environment and they put them more. That is rock art in form of what they see. So if you're going to have the rock art, you have to have the kind of perception of, of your of your painting about your environment. No, this one has. I think the painting should have coming from rock art here, similar. It's not similar. What you can see. I believe in that is the reason why I committed it. Of course, I will be able to make that it's not for me to make to make it. Of course, there are other now it's technology for the scenario. I only use history to make the case. And other history that have been prevented in the domain of art, science, and then that's it. So we have Mr. Uh, uh, Madeni online. Can you allow ask a question? We have Madeni online. Okay, okay, Madeni. Yeah, thank you very much for the wonderful paper presented to us, um, our presenter. You know, I just have a few questions. You know, we raised this issue during our last conference in Zaria. You know, the issue of science, I'm coming, I'm coming, let me just, yeah, the issue of science and um, archaeology. You know, now what I'm asking you, unless it does have my reasons for asking now, you know, your, your paper topic is you're looking at technology as um, what we want to use to identify the people of Ife. And from what you've presented to us, I think you're using the scientific analysis of the residues of iron. Let's get this quote. What I was expected, actually, you mentioned because I think uh, what I was expecting is uh, to see the strength of the unique identity. What made Ife iron smelting different? Because we want to identify what makes the technology. And you know, when we're talking about technology in iron smelting, we're looking at how those ions were separated, looking at the furnaces and the process they use. So I think that should be the strength of your people. I think you are doing because we are, because we say science. Yes, archaeology is a uh, science and is in both. We should also be careful in trying to align with the sciences that yeah, we are pure science. Yes, some of us we have science background and we want to this But to me, or you think you've really looked at because you look at the residue, this all the slab and this thing scientifically you gave the content but i was looking at that because we want to identify what make ife iron smelting special okay thank, thank you thank you very much you know i said um part of the work we don't need to carry out to project study now i mentioned this we will carry out the kind of ethnographical research as part of the work that we don't so see if you can get remnants of those tools not 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 that Maybe the kind of metals they use, maybe cutlass, gold, that are still well preserved, and then look at them, the kind of mythology, and then the kind of comparison. That's the thing that I'm But I'm talking about those archaeological materials that it's slab. The kind of metal that are done here is not something that is, I can say, I uh, not part of the living village. As part of the past, it's the industry now, all over the world, as scientists. I'm going to say we cannot say the archaeology and science, it's kind of realistic to the 21st century. I tell you that move on the data of description the position. What is the expensive description that's not about uh cultural synthesis? This is the when you take a material like this, okay, that this is black, it's big, it's small, it has photos, that photos, that is the Because it's something that moves from that level of description, cultural history, to cultural process. And cultural process do what? 
explanation. If you want to explain why, how, things happen in the past, you have to adopt pure and better. These days, there is no other way for us to do is to be a both description and explanation, cultural history, cultural process. I'm not saying that archaeology should be strictly based on fine. No, 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 no. It's hard to compile. It has moved from the level of 18th century archaeology. What are doing with the material clear description? You take the box here, let's take the samples, uh, the full uh, uh, playing pattern. Are, no, 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 no. That's not behind that. We do that. But that's not what I take the laboratory. What is it? What are the microscope? And this is from it. So what are the question of why and how does it drive the woman evolved? And that is why, to me, you have to combine such an action. So we have the final presenter. Okay. I think the, the person should be that person. Yeah. Okay. Hello, everyone. Good evening. <laughs> My name is uh, Dr. Shama Bonfia. Doing this presentation. Uh, in collaboration with my husband, he's also an archaeologist to the boss. Um, when, when I received the, when I wanted to write an abstract, I think, ah, what do I write? So I just said, okay, you just write something that is wide heritage, religion, all right? So today we're looking at indigenous songs and folk tales as sort of history and cultural identity in southwestern Nigeria. That's what it is. So this is not to bore you with so many words, but just to give you a background information with regards to song and folk tales. We all know what song and folk tales are. Like. Growing up, uh, we have our grandmas, you know, the elders telling some kind of you know, telling us different stories, singing to us, you know. And what what's quite unique about song and folk tales is that like, they are all and transmitted from one generation to another. So basically, I want to explore, you know, the world of indigenous song and folk tales. And you know, how it will help us to deepen our uniqueness and significance of different um, societies. But in this case, he was he was of South Eastern Nigeria. Let's learn to start. So that's uh, for our friends. Uh, from the Allah, from Uganda, that may not snow. So in Nigeria, we have um, six geographic schools from Southwest, Southwest, North Central, East, Southeast, and South. South, South. So I'm focusing on Southeast. And in Southwest, we have six states. I guess they in the Imo, none of that. So that's a brief concept, uh, conceptual framework of what these things could look you know, indigenous songs are actually music, musicals. That's what brings the belief system, the value, the tradition of a particular society. All right. Then folk tales are stories, and that are quite traditional, and they are passed from one generation to another. They that is placeless in the sense that you can you can talk about them in this context, in this place, and also use it some question. They are timeless. The, 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 the folk tale that we are told still, the, even if you bring it up now, it will still is a little bit that we have to listen to it as well. Next slide. So, those characteristics of the last song, the folk tale, uh, very briefly, they are from the original, transmitted, and they are said in indigenous, in native language. They connote emotional expression. When we are singing, both uh, Praise song or funeral song, there is a emotion that goes with it. And they are played with traditional instruments and melodies. And they also, once it comes up, everybody won't go and start singing now, or everybody starts. We will want to participate. It's quite common now, right? Then folk tales are all similar, um, so already done as well. And it helps in transmitting different cultural traits. It also have multiple versions and variants. You can use it, you can drink it in the way you want it. And more especially, you have moral lessons. You know, after listening to different school films, what are the moral lessons? That's like this. So just to give you a sense of um, some of the 
cultural object or musical instrument that are used to perform some of these songs, okay? Um, and in one what that is called in the Igbo language, Igbo, in English it's drum. Then this one here is including gong and when a young gong. Okay, so we have various We have the orchestra. We have the poop, We have the rattle and all of that and all of that. Yes. So let's look at different indigenous songs. We have war songs, bed songs, funeral songs, rite of passage song, free song, and all that, and the ceremonial song. Now, um, when, it, when it comes to war songs, what, what connoted other things? Military activities, you know, it's, it's used to invoke aggressive sentiments. Like when you hear the song, you, you have to rise up and join. In whatever like this is going on, and it reflects sometimes it reflects um, experiences and emotions of people that have participated in war in the time past. Right, like I, I, I remember so during the Biafra war, there are specific songs that you sing when they are you know um, moving along, and they also create a sense of unity and patriotism. Okay, so one of the songs that I would like to say, and I would, uh, I would like you guys to join me, like I was telling my brother, I was going to sing. So there's this one song that was saying, um, not knowing you know, to commemorate war events or whatever. So it goes this way. Zoku zoku eni ba eni ba zoku eni ba. Zoku 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 you know, by a mighty nation. So you can see how, you know, how sang and how people are, you know, really vibrant about it and um, joining in the song. Then for, uh, you know, real life is new, which is used to suit children. When I was preparing the presentation, I said to myself, when I had my first child, you know, having a challenge of being a first mom, trying to not sleep, you know, crying and all of that. I remember singing a forest song. So, Sleep, sleep, my baby. I forgot totally our own indigenous song. I never used it. So when I was writing it, I said, Jesus, you can imagine me, people, an archaeologist, singing something that is different, not even uh, familiar to me. So, and Lula is quite uh, sweet, you know, it's kind of repetitive, but it tells a child, a, a baby, to speak like this one is, Oh, yeah, me, me, one. So it's kind of asking the baby, uh, who is eating this baby? Why is this baby crying? Is it the ego that treats the baby or the chicken or whatever? So it's quite, uh, it, it's really what? What is that meaning? Is that rocking the baby, the baby goes to sleep. So we have Nara song, which is quite, um, you know, connotes grief and anger, you know, it's like when somebody is you know, even if I think somebody's uh, all like dead scared, I don't know, let's go to the next slide. So when it comes to folk tales, um, growing up all, you know, we, 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 one word we must have listened to folk tales, be it with our parents, our grandparents, or tell by moonlight, or, you know, in, in the village, on that day we come at our big tale stories. And in a typical Igbo folk tale, one of the key things that plays out in the seven is, is targeted for children, and the tales explore things of bravery, uh, communal values, wisdom, and one particular character that plays out all the time is Sinfe, right? And we call it Sinfe in our indigenous language. That is being seen somebody as a cunning uh, figure. We also have the leopard, the lion, they associated with courage and bravery. Like, I'm going to say that folk tales are usually told to convey in a message, maybe positive or negative, but most, most, most uh, often than not, it's uh, a positive. Where children are told stories of how to be good citizens, or if you do bad, what happens to you, and all of that. So it always showcases um, bad character, or good character being indicated and rewarded, why the bad character or dishonest character punished. Next slide. So um, we have different book tales. I think you can catch all of them. But just, uh, just history. We have animal so tales like how to touch a child and show all of our stories. Sometimes like the corny animal one, but the 
other other animals and you treat them and at the end of the day they left him in heaven and he has to sell potential. We have realistic hotel with that. It's quite realistic. Yes, it, it tells stories of what is happening in the contemporary you know, with the illnesses at that time. We also have fairy tales that realize Prince Charming, which all of us you know, uh, uh, knows about. That's one thing. So, so uh, basically, what I wanted to portray here is to, to bring about some of the themes that are kind of not being talked about in most Muslims with the internet. With the phones, with the tablets, you know, television, and all of that, children are not being bring up in the way that maybe it was done in the last 30 years. And it's leading to our culture being eroded. All right. I can't remember, I, I don't know how many families are still selling their children folk tales. Folk tales that are related to their culture, to their tradition. All right. Uh, I'm not sure. So I, I, I did it in a way to. Bring to the fore that it's really good to go back, go back in the time past, bring up all these things. Yes, I'm not saying children are not to use their phones or whatever, but they should also be introduced to these, these things. And what has significance? Folk tales serve as a platform to locate the richness and the diversity. So folk tales and songs to one of them, the diversity of various traditions and culture. There are songs that wherever you are and you hear that song, nobody will tell you. That is an outside song or it's a little song of the universe. You know, in my and in because that is what they are known for. And it provides a means for different ethnic groups to express their unique culture. We are quite unique in our culture and our community. The way European person dresses is different from the way an Indian person dresses, and it's quite unique in diverse. And it also helps to transmit intergenerational knowledge. I wonder what's going to happen with all these perfect things. Maybe the next 20 years, 20 years, or only 20 years, not a little children will be even more perfect things. Yeah. Yeah. And they will be so much more quite important. Then it also helps to present our culture pride. Right? Yeah. Pride of means. <laughs> so, um, this is just a complete, this is by no means a complete picture of the indigenous song. I just presented a couple here. But just to showcase some of these knowledge systems, cultural objects that we are handed out from us, from our forefathers, from to us. And we, are, we, we should do what we can, you know, have this agenda to work for us, to try to sound to the other generation. For those of you that are here, the young boys that are saying, but if you get married, but you have a good family, try to interpret this um, act of telling your current stories, making them to sing, and I don't know the fact that we are there during the whole ceremony. And there was this lovely young boys that were speaking in Europe about it, and everybody we are mesmerized when we are speaking. So, um, that's the end of the evening. Okay, um, thank you very much for the presentation. I'm actually kind of attached to like, that application simply because during my undergraduate uh, projects, I did some similar and I got food as uh, and uh, musical history has a kind of relationship um, with and um, that's why it's with them. Just like we had the uh, um, Takala and she took the drum from the fire. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I was just like, are there specific um, songs that when not, when not attached to this? Our instruments so, who give the sense of evil culture. Like, are these songs that once you don't attach to our instruments, it doesn't portray the culture of evils. I need to give points. Just like once most go to like a big ceremony now and you want to spray someone, you have to come with the culture. You have to you have to play that culture so you know that you want to give a reference to somebody. So I want you to like place this um close relationship with evil uh, instruments and performance. So yeah, and you know, when it comes to, if I just, if I, if I just do what I said, what I, um, when, when it comes to songs and 
It depends on the environment. There are some that you can actually give a healthy niche to it. I just think it's a people who respect it. Like the uh, music dancers. Yes. People we 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 dance to it, we wouldn't even mind that they're just saying we don't start it. So what I can assume from what you said, yes, it's very important to marry songs with musical instruments, but you can actually you can actually have some songs that don't need to be in a very low key sense. You cannot come to a ceremonial event and you don't have the music. But you can go to a very small arena. There is no there is no okay, people will still that in the I didn't hear you. Yes. Yeah, thank you, God. Yeah, thank you. It's not a question, it's just a suggestion. Uh, my, you know, we're talking about um, intangible heritage, and uh, the presenters um, presented some challenges we have in the present century, in the 21st century, with Rodin. I think um, the presenter and uh, others, those of us in the room, I think it's time we can we begin to talk about, one, the documentation of these folklores. Because um, as we speak now, I think we should also try to document this folklore, this evil is in, in this digital platform or this social media space, whereby this Gen Z or this young generation can have access to them and also have, um, um, they can have it at the click of their finger, that is documentation and presentation of this, some of these uh, intangible heritage that are gradually fading away. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. Um, on a final note, a big thank you to all of you in the house for being with us. And I hope I miss you shot together. Thank you and thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's true. So you have to watch the